Okay, so I had Mina Loy, and I'm supposed to uh, discuss her uh, her themes of sexuality and her poetry. So uh, first off, I didn't know who Mina Loy was, so I had to look her up, and I found a really good quote from um, a guy that I researched. <laughs> if I can find his name real quick. Okay, his name was Rob Sheffield. And who is she? Well, he said, is she a poet? A real poet? A great poet? A character? A feminist icon? A well-connected dilettante? A fashion plate? A nice little role model? A boho scare artist? A mad, bad, and dangerous to know psychodrama vampire lampshade pimp? <laughs> and if you don't know, like, if you don't get the lampshade pimp thing, it's because she made lamps and sold them. You know, that was one of the little things she did. She was also an artist, and uh, she experimented with plays, and she did lots of poetry, as you can tell, because you read for today. Well, uh, first I'm going to look at Songs to Joannis, and I have uh, written what I'm going to look at. And um, so first off, it's good to note that, as uh, Peter Quartermain says, uh, you should take this to be a single work within which each song is at once a fact fragment and a whole. She also looks at romance and sexuality of women in this. So first off, we're going to look at page 53, stanza 1, which is the first one off the bat. We're only going to, look, we're only going to stay this one, on this one for a little bit. So in the beginning it says, Spawn of fantasies, silting the appraisable pig Cupid, his rosy snout, rooting erotic garbage, once upon a time, pulls a weed, white star tipped among wild oats, summed in mucous membrane. What did y'all take away from just that little bit? Katie. It's because you're writing people. Anything, any yeah, little um, thing. The fact that they said mucous membrane was very, and rooting erotic garbage. That's actually one of her most famous lines, actually, because she's saying, you know, spawn of fantasy. She's actually talking down and denouncing what they called love at the time period when she was writing this. Because at this time period, most of us would know this is the Victorian kind of, you know, keep your virginity with you until it, you get married, you know, courting and all that kind of stuff. Well, she's saying that, you know, by saying pig cupid, it evokes images of pigs which were at the time kind of nasty and uh, his rosy snout rooting erotic garbage. These are the stories and the poetry at the time, you know, you think of you know the sonnets of Shakespeare where they're all, oh, loves this amazing thing. And she was denouncing it because she felt that the women got the bad part in this. You know, women couldn't express themselves. Well, moving on to page 56, stanza 4. We can see, this is going to be a contrast with the next stanza, I mean, stanza nine, excuse me. This is going to be a contrast with the next stanza. Um, so in nine, when we lifted our eyelids on love, a cosmos of colored voices and laughing honey and spermatozoa at the core of nothing in the milk of the moon. What did y'all take away from this? Courtney. <laughs> Compared to the first one, at least, it sounds more like rich and like almost compassionate towards love, and like she kind of enjoys it. How about you, Mary Catherine? She sits firm. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's all I got. No, I, she started out like if you just read this by itself, it was like, oh, okay, well, it's rich and it's honey and it's silk and it's love, and then you're like, oh, sperm. Okay, you know, like she she makes it from something. Theory, that the word? Theory. To something biological, mm -hmm. and I like that. So. Uh, so, how many of you have heard like the saying, "Love is blind"? Well, she says, "When we lifted our eyelids on love, they're opening their eyes to love." A cosmos of colored voices and laughing honey. It's good, but then there's a pause, and then she gets into what it really was, and spermatozoa, and at the core, at the core of nothing in the milk of the moon. She said, "It's not this great." thing it's sperm and nothing else and then it's very does anyone else see that it's kind of childish in a way 
the way she's describing it, you know, it's all laughter and you know, colored voices, and then she says, it seems really blissful to me, like carefree, like a child would be. Yeah, she's taking in open kind of childish view of love that was kind of pause, not positive, but present at the time. You know, love is this wonderful thing. Well, it's probably good now to state that this poetry, this whole section, Songs to Joannis, was written because she was falling out of love for a man named Giovanni Papini, who was a futurist. She had a lot of rendezvous with men, but he was just one of them, and she kind of, this is her falling out of love with him. That's why you get these nasty images of love and what it really truly is. Well, looking at 10, you kind of get into the more serious note of love. It's really short. Shuttlecock and battle door, a little pink love, and feathers are strewn. Does anyone know what this means? I'm asking everyone because I didn't know what it meant. I had to look it up. Isn't a shuttlecock something for a bad mm -hmm. bird? So back at that time, they played badminton with actual feathers instead of, you know, the little plastic ones that we have. Well, after one, like, round of badminton, the feathers would be useless and they couldn't use it anymore, so they had to get a new shuttlecock. What she's saying is shuttlecock and battle door, the penis and the vagina, so man and woman. A little pink love, not even a good love. It was, you know, just a hit and run. And she said, and feathers are strewn. <laughs> what she's saying is she's become aware, she's become aware that who she's calling Joannis or Giovanni Papini, his sexual contribution is wearing thin. He's not giving into it anymore. He's not, he's, he's only good for a hit and run because he's falling out of love with her. Shocking. Okay, uh, so 13. Um, come to me, there is something I have got to tell you and I cannot tell something, and I cannot tell something taking shape, something that has a new name, a new dimension, a new use, a new illusion. It is ambient, and it is in, our, in your eyes something shiny, something only for you, something that I must not see. It is in my ears something very resonant, something that you must not hear, something only for me. Let us be very jealous, very suspicious, very conservative, very cruel, or we might make an end of the jostling of aspirations. Disorbed Invalid egos, where two or three are welded together, they shall become God. There's a pause. Oh, that's right. Keep away from me. Please give me a push. Don't let me understand you. Don't realize me. Or we might tumble together, des depersonalized, identical, into, a tr into the tr terrific nirvana. Me, you, you, me. What do you get from this? <laughs> Since something is taking shape, it makes me think. Maybe she's pregnant or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It sounds like she's more scared of having a child, and having to be a family. One, two, three, all from your own God. That's a good. That's a good uh, insight observation because she did have multiple children and by some different men, and uh, that's a really good way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. When I read it, I thought it was, you know, she was in love and she was changing her mind because, you know, there's that pause and then it's almost a shift. It's a totally different person. It's not let me in anymore. It's like, no, wait, back off. We don't want to become the same person. Well, it's actually <laughs> about the modernization of sexuality and an openness to the world. She wants to be open. It's about trying new things. It's about trying fetishes. You know, she's saying, come on, come to me. There's something I've got to tell you. You know, let's try this. And then at the end, she's like, wait, no, I can't let you in that far. I can't tell you everything. Fifty Shades of Grey. So uh, lastly, we'll look at 16. I think I'm saying these numbers right if I'm not correct. You are. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> We might have lived together in the lights of the Arno, or gone apple-stealing under the sea, or played hide-and-seek in love and cobwebs, and a lullaby on a tin pan, and talked till there were no more tongues, tongues to talk with, and never have known any better. What do you get from this one, Jesse? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, this is one of the first times that uh, it says for one thing, like it talks about talking. Um, so this is more of 
Um, I don't know, it says we, we talked until there was no more tongues to talk with, so they just like ran out of, uh, I mean, coming from like all this sexual experimentation and then like, but what do we talk about? Anyone else have their ideas? We don't know what we just found out the last one. It's more of like they're going to have people to join them out of tongues to continue with you. So this is their Italian paradise. Because at this point in time, she's in, Tus <laughs> she's in Florence, Italy. And in the Arno is actually a river in Tuscany. I didn't know that. Um, and so you get the image of the apple stealing, which is more of a biblical allusion towards, you know, forbidden love or forbidden things. Well, this time they've had together is forbidden because she is married. And this is not her husband <laughs> at all. <laughs> Nowhere close. <laughs> and so this is their, their Italian paradise. And, you know, she says, and never have known any better. So they, she's awakened. She's, she knows it's wrong and well he's out of love with her and she's falling out of love with him so it's uh, the best time for them to move on this is really since this is the end of songs to Joannes that I'm going to be talking about I wanted to close by saying that it's really she has an open view of female sexuality because this isn't her you know oh I can't say these things oh tee -hee -hee. <laughs> she's saying you know your sex is boring Let's try some new things. You know, this Italian paradise with this man that I met, and he talks about futurism. <laughs> He's smart. <laughs> and she, you know, she's striking back against her Victorian, you know, the ideal where she comes from is women should be quiet. Keep your virginity. Don't talk about sex. You don't get to initiate sex. The men get to initiate sex. And this is her lashing out at her, you know, pent up society. Well, uh, next we're going to talk about aphorisms on futurism in on page 149. So, th just from the title, does this give anything away before you even read it? Did you even know what aphorisms on futurism was? Who looked up, which I'm sure you all did, <laughs> what futurism is? Okay. So, I might just not be the smartest person in here, but I didn't know what aphorisms were either. So, <laughs> just so everybody knows, aphorisms are a terse saying, an expression, or a general truth, a principle, or astute observation, and spoken or written on a laconic and memorable form. Laconic means, you know, using very few words, which she does in her poetry. She's very sparse with her wording. Um, in futurism, in poetry, since we're only talking about her poems, I'm going to just touch on that. They're characterized by unexpected combinations of images and by its hyper-concision of sp speech and length. So the hyper-concision of speech and length is, again, the laconic. It's very small, and she doesn't go into like, big details, and she doesn't you know, describe these scenes that are in depth and all that. She's concise and to the point, but she's also using images that contrast one another or that are not really opposites of one another, but they shock you, you know, pig cupid things of that nature. So, aphorisms or futurisms, this is her rule, you can tell it as like her rules to live by, you know. But actually, she's actually refusing to conform to the futurist ideal mindset because the future, like, um, like when she's speaking, she's talking to a you instead of a we or our like the futurists would use in their manifestos and their literature and uh, their art. They would focus more on we as a whole, um, the hour, the society as it comes to one, which is kind of unitalitarian. Uh, so. But it's supposed to read and look like a manifesto but it refuses to use, she's refusing again to conform to a certain standard of time, just like she's confusing, she's refusing to conform to, you know, the standards of Victorian society. She's also refusing to 
conform to this new society that she's become a part of. She was also, in all of her work, she wasn't a one, you couldn't define her as being just a futurist. She used different forms of literature throughout all of her work. She never settled on one thing. I mean, the girl made lamps, for God's sake. <laughs> she was also an artist. You should also look up some of her art. It's really good. But I didn't get a chance to read any of her plays, but they're also, I've heard, very experimental, and they're not very keeping with the times. She was very, you know, like we've said before, she doesn't outpour of her own emotions, not what society tells her to. So lastly, we're going to look at her ideas in the Feminist Manifesto. Who liked this? <laughs> That's it? Only two of them? Is it because she kind of called out both sexes? I appreciated that. I also just liked how, I liked how it looked. It looked like you could hit somebody in the face with it. It made a difference, you know? And that's what I want out of my manifestos. <laughs> Have any of you read this before? Okay, well, um, I want to look at just a few of the, the qualities that she puts into it. The first off, I'd like to ask a question. So, after reading this, this is only for the women in class. Would you rather be a mistress or a mother? Because you get no other choices. Mistress. Yeah, totally. Do you know what the difference between a mistress and a mother are? So the mistress was good at sex, but she was a terrible mother. And the mother was bad at, bad at sex, but she was a good mother. You would want to be the mother in that Victorian society, and she's calling them out. She says, there are no restrictions. There are no restrictions. The woman who is so completely evolved as to be unselfconscious in sex will prove a restrictive influence on the temperamental expansion of the next generation, the woman who is a poor mistress will be an incompetent mother, an inferior mentality, and will enjoy an inadequate apprehension of life. How many of you believe that? Do you believe if you're a good mother, you're bad at sex? No. No. <laughs> do, you, do you believe that at the time she's talking about, you know, women who grow up with this mindset that a mother should be bad at sex, should she educate her children? Is she teaching them the right way? You know, it's better to be bad at sex. Don't, don't be a mistress. Be a mother. Do you believe that that was a healthy way for their society to grow up and to like mature? Even on the men, like you want a mother figure, you don't want a mistress. What man's really going to do that in their time period? I mean, there's books about this stuff, people. <laughs> She's conforming to both the mistress and the mother. She's trying to open your eyes and say, you know, you can be a mother and be bomb in bed. I mean, you don't. And also, you can talk about it <laughs> with people. You don't need to shelter it and keep it hidden because, you know, if you don't teach the coming up generation, you know, don't be self-conscious of yourself you should be more unself-conscious when it comes to sex in the bedroom the next thing she talks about is virtue she says it's the self the first self-enforced law for the female sex as a protection against the man-made bogey of virtue which is the principal instrument of her subjugation would be the unconditional surgical destruction of virginity throughout the female population at puberty. Wow. So, she's saying, get rid of your virginity because it's making you a prude. Not really. <laughs> but, she's, she's trying to, she, I mean, she's using these terms like unconditional surgical destruction of virginity. It's so powerful. She's not saying, you know, just go out and lose your virginity. She's saying, remove it. Rip it out. She says, go out with a bang. <laughs> How many of you see that as like a good thing? Do you, I mean, th there's a lot today that are like, you know, we're raised in a society that some are like, keep your virginity. It's good to keep it for the person you love. And then you're also dictated, lose it. I know I have a couple friends that are like, get rid of it. <laughs> just, just go find somebody. But I also have friends that are like, give it to someone who is 
you know, you feel a connection with. That wasn't, you know, you were not supposed to give your virginity back in her time. You were supposed to keep it. She also discusses that next in marriage, which this is where she's kind of sticking up with the man. She says, the advantages of marriage are too ridiculously ample compared to all other trades. For under modern, modern conditions, a woman can accept preposterously luxurious support from a man without return of any sort, even offspring, as a thank offering for her virginity. So, ladies and men, <laughs> keep your virginity and you'll get everything. <laughs> you see what she's saying? All a woman at this time had to do was remain virtuous, remain true to herself and to her future husband, and she was good for the rest of of her life. That's actually kind of cool. I would like that. <laughs> you know, if, I, if I give it to you, you're going to pay for like my sports car. That's great. <laughs> but you see what she's saying? She's saying women. I mean, come on. The men are being cheated too. And that's kind of odd seeing that this is a feminist manifesto. I know nowadays there's even some men that are like, oh, they're just hating on men. But she's saying, you know, it's really about equality. You know, you can't say, oh, I'm a feminist, but I think I should keep my virginity and you should pay for my sports car. <laughs> you can't say that because you're, you're not equalizing the field for both parties. She's saying, women, get out there, pull your own weight in a relationship. You know, don't be so Victorian. Don't sit at home and twiddle your fingers and let somebody else take care of your children. I mean, they weren't even taking care of their children. She didn't even take care of her children. When she left to go to Florence, Italy to be with her second man, or four, I don't know which one. She was really taking on that role. She decided that she was going to leave home and she left her kids with the nanny. And she decided to pursue this life for her, which in the sense of the feminist manifesto, we can't blame her for that. You know. So lastly, she's talking about <coughs> maternity which is a big thing for her because, and she's kind of being ironic. She says, the woman who has, not who has not succeeded in striking that advantageous bargain is prohibited from any but serendipitous reaction of life stimuli and entirely debarred maternity. Every woman has a right to maternity. Every woman of superior intelligence should realize her race responsibility in producing children in adequate proportion to the unfit or degenerate members of her sex. How many of y'all believe that? She's saying, she's kind of digging the knife into the women at the time because they were supposed to, you know, if you were virtuous, you got to be a mother. You know, you keep your maternity. But if you went out and were the mistress, and not even just the mistress to a married man, you could just go out and have sex and just get rid of your virginity like that with somebody who's unmarried. And she's saying you're still barred maternity because you're not really a mother at that point because you didn't stay virtuous to your future husband. And then she's ironically saying, you know, we need to do it so that we can make just as many children and they'll be just as good as those women who were mistresses. She's saying, you can't be, well, the society at the time was saying, you can't be both. But she's saying, you can be both. You can be a mistress and have just as good children as the people in high society. So, mother in the streets, mistress in the bed. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. I mean, even using those labels, though, for her would have been, you know, if you look, go out and label somebody, oh, you're a mistress. <laughs> I mean, at this time period, that was the end-all, be-all. I mean, labels are even more back then than they were now, you know. If you go up to some girl, I mean, I have friends I call Hope. I mean, <laughs> they never tell me they don't appreciate it, but, <laughs> I mean, people nowadays can go out and these labels aren't as big of a deal, whereas back then, mistress was just like going up to somebody and calling them a slut. Yeah, you're a harlot. A harlot. <laughs> So she's really, at this, she's really having fun in this. And it, it's serious, but she's having fun in it. She's poking at people, and she's, well, the high class people, she's not really poking at the other people. But 
Even after that, she says, each child of a superior woman should be the result of a definite period of psychic development in her life and not necessarily of a possibly irksome and outworn countenance of an, of an alliance. I take that as being, you should have a child not to keep your marriage together. You should have a child because you're ready to have a child. You think it's the, good, the best time to bring a child in your life, not he's going to leave me, I'll spit out a baby. She's really saying, you know, take your sexuality into your own hands. Don't just have a baby because you need to have a baby or society tells you, have, or society tells you to have a baby or your parents are pressuring you to have a baby or even your husband's pressuring you to have a baby because she wouldn't see that as being a psychic, the perfect psychic development in a woman's life. She would see that as being something harmful to the woman. Also, she says, uh, for the harmony of the race, each individual should be the expression of an easy and ample interpenetration of the male and female temperaments, free of stress. Do anybody, does anybody know what interpenetration means? I thought it was something totally different than what it actually means. So it actually means a mixing or a mingling of two things, or more than two things. And she's saying, which is really a 21st century ideal, which is she's saying right here, she's saying we shouldn't be man-woman. We should have both traits of a man and a woman. We should be, you know, the woman should be powerful, and she should be uh, in charge of her own life, just like the man is powerful in charge of her own life. But a man should also be in the sense of what femininity is, and he should be caring and considerate and kind She's saying that we can't prosper as, a, as the human race without having both qualities in yourself. And lastly, if any of y'all read this one, she said, didn't get confused by the subject. She says, woman for her happiness must retain her deceptive fragility of appearance combined with indomitable will, irreducible courage, and abundant health the outcome of sound nerves. Another great illusion that woman must use, another great illusion that woman must use all her introspective, clear-sightedness and unbiased bravery to destroy for the sake of her self-respect is the impurity of sex, the realization and defiance of superstition that there is nothing impure in sex except in the mental attitude to it. That's strong. She's saying don't treat sex as this demonic, disgusting thing that you can't talk about in public. She's saying we should embrace it as being biological. You know, it's you can do it other than to make a baby. She said you can have sex in order to feel better, or you can have sex just because you want to. You need some release at that point in time. And how many of you agree with her? assessment of what the ideal woman should be. She should be strong, but she should also seemingly be fragile. That's kind of an oxymoron. You need to be strong or fragile. A vase that you can hurl against the wall and it'll crack, but it won't break. <laughs> Do you think a woman should be that? Do you feel that you should be either or, both should you be just strong without being fragile, or should you be strong or should you be fragile and not be strong? I think in a lot of those ways, it kind of puts you in the upper hand. If people underestimate you, but you come out on top, and they might have a little more respect for you, you know, to show that, uh, yeah, I can, I can take a beating, or I can take whatever the base throwing up against the wall, but you know, I can still go back to this like little beautiful inner petite thing, just as easy. Yeah. Anybody else? Anyway, oh, I I appreciate having a feminine appearance and long hair, makeup, and lipstick or whatever. But I will be damned if someone looks at me and they're like, "Oh, isn't she just Nikki looks so sweet? I could just pick her up and put her in a purse and just walk around." I'm like, God, no. I I mean, it, it, even if I want to be gentle and sweet, and I, I'm if anyone thinks I'm fragile just from looking at me, I don't want any of that now. I. In reality, though, we all have, you know, a fragileness. I mean, whether you want to admit it or not, you know, I mean, we all have those moments of weakness. Okay. Strong enough to be yourself, but fragile enough to realize that you're human. Um, I think that's what she meant. 
I think she meant, you know, we're supposed to have that little bit of fragility to us that we can uh, recognize you the fragility of others. Back, you yeah. yeah. You should know your limit. Yeah. You know, you should know when you're going to be hurled against the wall and break. Why do you think they're two different well, things? Yeah, I just think she's saying that, like, because of the way society views women, like, you can't look at yourself that way. You just have to recognize yourself as like, a human who, like, you're going to feel all of these things. And you, as a human, get to choose that. You Just because you're a woman, you don't have to choose to be either fragile or strong. You can be both because you're human, not necessarily just because you're labeled a woman. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because at that time period, sorry, no. at that time period, women weren't seen as human. They were property. You were a transaction. You were, I get this for marrying you. And she's saying, no. She said what you're saying. You're human. You know? You have your breaking points, but you also have the points where you can pick yourself up by your bootstraps. <laughs> Any other questions? Come on. You said you were going to keep me talking. Talk for Really? <laughs> Okay, well, I'm done. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, thank you, Daniel. So if you could just pass these around. <laughs> Make sure everybody gets one, fragile or not. <laughs> references to the time period in which Loy is writing. And I think it would behoove us to zero in a little bit more specifically on when these pieces um, are put together. Well, her, her Feminist Manifesto wasn't even published until after her death. Right? Yeah, the feminist, the feminist Manifesto was not published in her lifetime. But it was written in 1914. Songs to Joannes is written and published in 1917. So it's probably a good idea to keep the ideas in the Feminist Manifesto in the back of your mind when reading Songs to Joannes. And then some of the things that we see in Songs to Joannes will make a lot more sense. Um, how many of you found this a kind of baffling read, at least at first? Yeah, I mean, it's self-consciously difficult, right? This is probably the first thing we've read in this class that really belongs to uh, what we would call the avant-garde, right? The first piece of genuinely experimental literature we've read here. There are elements of experiments, particularly with uh, matters of perspective and heart of darkness, but this is probably the first sort of full-blown piece of experimentalism we've looked at, right? Formally, the Wild novel, the Shaw play, and the Yeats poems are all relatively conservative. Even if some of the issues they're dealing with are not. But yeah, Loy is associated with a number of different transcontinental, trans uh, transatlantic, even, movements. The first of which futurism, Daniel told us a little bit about. Right Now, one of the things that you've got in front of you is the account of the foundation of futurism and its first manifesto. So this was published in 1909 by the original leader of the Italian futurists, 
there were Italian futurists, there were German futurists, there were English futurists, French futurists. There were a couple of different, sometimes related, sometimes not, futurist movements that popped up. But yeah, F.T. Marinetti was the prime mover in futurism. He was a poet, he was a playwright, he was a novelist. And we see in Marinetti a distillation of the futurist's major concerns. Right? The situation he describes in his man of, in this tale of the foundation, his origin story for futurism here, right? He and his friends are pacing in an apartment. They've got all this pent up energy that they don't know what to do with, right? They're angry, they're fired up, and they're trying to figure out a direction for it, right? They're trying to find a focus for it. Right. Suddenly we were startled by the terrifying clatter of huge double-decker trams jolting by, all ablaze with different colored lights, as if they were villages in, in festive celebration, which the River Po, in full spate, suddenly shakes and uproots to sweep them away down to the sea, over the falls into the whirlpools of a mighty flood. Now the thing that inspires them here a tram, right, is important for two reasons. One, it's a machine. The futurists love machines. It's also, at least for 1909, a speedy mode of transport. They also love speed. And by speed, I mean the concept of speed, not speed as in like amphetamines. No, we're talking, they probably like that too, I don't know. But yes, yeah, speed, velocity, this is a big thing for them. Then the silence became more somber. Yet even while we were listening to the tedious mumbled prayers of an ancient canal and the creaking bones of dilapidated palaces on their tiresome stretches of soggy lawn, we caught the sudden roar of ravening motor cars right there beneath our windows. Come on, let's go, I said. Come on, my lads, let's get out of here. At long last, all the myths and mystical ideas are behind us. We're about to witness the birth of a centaur, and soon we shall witness the flight of the very first angels. We shall have to shake the gates of life itself to test their locks and hinges. Let's be off. See there, the Earth's very first dawn. Nothing can equal the splendor of the sun's red sword slicing through our millennial darkness for the very first time. So this idea of the, the driver of a car as centaur, right? What they imagine is this kind of mystical union of man and machine. Right. Your biological parts, flawed as they are, because they age, they wither and die. Melded with immortal machinery. So the futurist human ideal is basically what we would call a cyborg. Right? Part human, part machine. And we see here, if we look to the bottom of page 643, Marinetti, in order to avoid a couple of bicyclists, flips his car into a ditch. Oh, mother of a ditch, brim full with muddy water, fine repair shop of a ditch, how I relished your strength-giving sludge that reminded me so much of the saintly black breast of my Sudanese nurse. When I got myself up, soaked, filthy, foul-smelling rag that I was, from beneath my overturned car, I had a wonderful sense of my heart being pierced by the red-hot sword of joy. So what we have here is a, a kind of rebirth, right? I flip my car into the ditch, and as I climb out from under, like that combination of car and muddy water becomes a kind of substitute womb. So the new man is born out of the machine womb. And we can get a list of futurist values right, from looking at the manifesto that he then appends to this. 
We want to sing about the love of danger, about the use of energy and recklessness as common daily practice. Courage, boldness, and rebellion will be essential elements in our poetry. Up to now, literature has extolled a contemplative stillness, rapture, and reverie. We intend to glorify aggressive action, arrestive wakefulness, life at the double, the slap, and the punching fist. Right, so there's a glorification of energy and of violence. Now, there's another thing to note as we get a little further down here. Oh, there's, or is this remove, oh, hmm. Can anybody find where he talks about scorn for women? Bottom of 644, yes. Okay, there we go, yeah. I underlined it and accidentally struck it through. Actually, Marinetti did, in later versions of this manifesto, strike that part out. Because there were women in the Futurist movement who objected to this statement of scorn for women, right? We wish to glorify war, the soul cleanser of the world, militarism, patriotism, the destructive act of the libertarian, beautiful ideas worth dying for, and scorn for women. Right, so the futurist ideal is aggressively anti-feminist, aggressively anti-woman, in part because it is anti-maternal. It's anti-biological. Right. Woman as the continuation of the human race, right, this is how they're seeing it. Right, no, we want humanity by and large wiped out by war and replaced with man machines. They know that that includes yeah. And in fact at, an, at one point um, Marinetti says like the you know the oldest the oldest of us is thirty. Um, you know, we hope that we'll be dead by forty. Right? There's a yeah no, he didn't keep this promise. <laughs> he didn't stick with it. Um, but yeah, um, their ideal is one of this kind of vitalist, youthful energy. And once you can no longer keep up that youthful energy, according to Marinetti and his friends, you should just throw yourself on the dung heap of history because you're not contributing anymore. So the futurist ideal is aggressively masculine. And aggressively, like in a lot of ways, really good, anti-life. So, Mina Loy, her birth name actually is Mina Louvi. And she's born and raised in England, but she comes from a Hungarian Jewish background, a Hungarian Jewish family. And spent much of her adult life either on the European continent or in the United States. But, you know, she died in Aspen, Colorado, where she lived for a very long time. And she associated with the Futurists when she was living in Italy, when she was associating very, very closely with Giovanni Papini. And she absorbs some of their ideals but takes them in a rather different direction. Right? For one thing, she insists on maternity as something that is important and vital, right? In fact, there's actually there's something um, a little bit creepy in the way she insists on the superior woman's responsibility to breed, right? What she is... Um, pointing to there, we see this a little bit in Yeats as well when he keeps talking about one's, you know, one's blood music and one's duty to the race. She's there embracing the language of eugenics. Which was, in the early 20th century, regarded as part of valid scientific discourse. And indeed, 
even though she, we don't really see her in uh, like Songs of Joannis, do we see her really mixing human beings and machines up? What's she doing instead? There is an interest in science here, right? It talks a lot about celestial bodies and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, astronomical references. Celestial bodies, astronomical references, right? And when she's talking about the human body, in what sort of terms does she tend to reference it? Sack. Pardon? Meat sack. Okay, there's the, the thing about this, we'll get to the skin sack. There we are. There's, yeah, that's, uh, there's, the, uh, there, there's, there's uh, an image there that might be worth unpacking. Um, but, uh, she uses the term flesh a lot. Flesh, yeah. The physicality of the body, you know, the reality of the body. And we also see her using words like mucous membrane, spermatozoa, right? Yeah, she, a lot of medical precision here, right? Biological precision. So she uses precise biological terminology. So I think, you know, Daniel said something that was like, well, she tends to you know, mystify in order to mock um, ideals of, you know, the sort of ideal of fairy tale bourgeois love. One of her means for undercutting this is strict biological language, right? Spermatozoa, you know, emptying out into nothing, right? She's talking about know, the act of conception there. There is also a narrative underlying Psalms of Joannes um, that is something beyond just the falling out of love with Papini. But we'll get to that in a minute. Now there's another movement with which Loy is uh, associated that springs up in Europe and in the United States, mostly actually in, in Zurich in Europe and in New York in the United States. Loy is part of the New York movement. It's called Dada. Anybody ever heard of Dada? Anybody familiar with Dada? Okay, Sarah, what's Dada? Do you remember anything about Dada? Um, kind of a surrealist movement where they're mm -hmm. embracing nonsense, really. Yes, yeah, surrealism grew out of Dada as Dada sort of wore itself out. But futurism is a pre-war philosophy, right? Before the First World War, you have these guys glorifying these killer machines. Dada is something that comes about really as the war starts taking shape. And most of the people involved in it are exiles of various sorts. Uh, for example, one of the, the guy who wrote uh, the Dada Manifesto that you have at the very end of the handout, Tristan Zara. His real name was Sami Rosenstock. He was a Romanian Jew hiding out in Zurich, right, trying to get away from war violence. So what the Dadaists argue is that art is essentially nonsense. Right? It's useless. It's pointless. Anything can be art. If I point at something and say, that's art, then it is, because I've chosen it to be. There's a, a famous poem that Sara wrote, it's simply called How to Make a Dadaist Poem, and essentially he says just take a bunch of words, you know, take a sheet of paper, write some words on it, cut it up, throw them in a bag, empty the bag, there's your poem. Right? Everything is left up to chance. The whole point of Dada is probably best, to, the, to the extent that there is a point, because it's, you know, it is in some ways an aesthetic of the pointless, is probably best summed up in the performances that the Dada poet Hugo Ball used to give at a cabaret in Zurich called the Cabaret Voltaire. He would dress himself up in a sort of cardboard suit of armor with a conical hat, make himself look like a bishop or a pope. 
And he would read these nonsense poems, right? These poems were just sort of composed of nonsense words with suggestive syllables with a background of drumming. And the whole point, the idea, was to make fun of the serious, sincere, professional bourgeois artist. So what these guys are doing is trying to poke holes in the idea of art as having some sort of mystical transcendence, some kind of mystical importance. Now, Loy, as I said, is uh, associated with the New York group of Dadaists, um, whose leader was the French artist Marcel Duchamp. Anybody ever heard of Duchamp? Is this a familiar name to anyone? He did one really very famous thing in art history. Um, there was um, a, an, exhi um, an exhibition of work by young artists um, in New York City to which Duchamp made a submission. His submission was a urinal, just ordinary urinal taken off of a wall that he signed with the name R. Mutt. And the point he was trying to make by submitting this was, again, that art is anything we call art. If I take a urinal and say it's a piece of art, take me at my word. I didn't make it, but I chose it. I decided it was art. So Dada is, in a lot of ways, a kind of elaborate prank. But it has largely the same purpose that we see as all the biological terminology, all the biological language in Songs of Joannis. Right? It's about deflation. It's about demystifying. It's about sort of breaking that aura of the mystic aesthetic around the artist, right? That, say, the decadence in a previous generation had tried so hard to build up. Is, now, is yeah, go ahead. Akin to like the nihilist idea that nothing has any meaning unless it's being assigned a meaning sort of thing? Yeah, um, Dada is actually very closely related to um, philosophical nihilism. And again, I think we have to remember again when Dada arose and what sorts of people, refugees, exiles, people who had been pushed out of their homes by war. These were the people who were making this kind of art. Right? They were outsiders wherever they happened to live. They couldn't go back to what they'd known. And to them, the war and the atrocities committed during the war essentially just rendered you know, rendered human life seemingly pointless, right? If this is what people do to each other, then why do we exist at all? And it certainly made a practice like the making of beautiful things for the sake of having beautiful things seem ridiculous. So because they're artists, the way they know how to respond is artistically, and so they respond with a kind of art of nonsense. But there is, at least in Loy's work, she was, at, she was Duchamp's mistress for a little while, and she also had a relationship with um, an English Dadaist, a guy by the name of Arthur Craven, um, and Craven was best known for, uh, not so much for his art as for his willingness to punch people. Um, he was also an amateur pugilist, and shortly after they married, um, he disappeared from a boat uh, somewhere off the coast of Mexico. No one knows, to this day, no one knows what happened to Arthur Craven. Right? He just vanished. But that's a side note. <laughs> now, could any of you detect, like, I'm going to talk a little bit now about narrative structure in the Songs of Joannes. Could any of you detect even apart from the whole loss of love thing that Daniel already talked about, could any of you detect a story here? The closest I got to what I thought it was before I came to class today was, mm -hmm. it sounds like she's at some kind of club or party or something. Okay. And 
and then she leaves with her companion. Mm -hmm. They get busy, and then <laughs> a lot. That, she talks about alienation at the end, so it's like yeah. it didn't work out, or you know, uh -huh. it's like a one night stand type thing. Sure. That's what yeah. I mean. Now she's actually describing a fairly lengthy liaison, a fairly lengthy relationship, and it's based on a myth from late antiquity. Are any of you familiar with the story of Cupid and Psyche? Any of you know this one? Yes. Erica, you do? I, I remember it, I just cannot. Okay. <laughs> That's all right? We'll explain. <laughs> okay, so the Cupid and Psyche myth, um, at least the version that's best known, comes from a late Latin novel by a guy by the name of Apuleius called The Golden Ass. And it's Essentially, a record of like there's there's a guy who upsets a priest of the goddess Isis and gets turned into a donkey, and you know then is told all of these sort of stories of you know the romances of the gods in order to help him get back to his essentially to to make himself more human, right? <clears throat> to develop into a human being again. And the Cupid and Psyche story is part of this. Essentially, Cupid, right? God of love with his little wings and his little arrows, falls in love with a mortal woman, and they marry, but the stipulation is that she only meets with him in the dark. She has no idea who he is. And yet, yeah, like, only encounters him under cover of night, under cover of darkness. During the day, she's left alone. At night he comes to her, but she is not allowed to look at him. She's never, she's never supposed to see him. So, our enterprising young psyche once decides that uh, she's too curious. She has to see his face. And so she holds a lantern over him while he's sleeping, finds out who he is. A little bit of lantern oil spills onto his body. He burns him. He wakes up and gets raging pissed and leaves. And then the rest of the story is taken up with Psyche trying to win her husband back. Right, so the idea that looking at your love too closely kills love. And there are references to the myth sprinkled throughout the poem as a way of linking some of these fragments together. Right, so if we look at that first fragment on page 53 that Dan already pointed us to, spawn of fantasies, silting the appraisable pig cupid his rosy snout, rooting erotic garbage, once upon a time, right, fairy tale language there, pulls a weed white star topped among wild oats sewn in mucous membrane, I would an eye in a Bengal light, eternity in a skyrocket, constellations in an ocean, whose rivers run no fresher than a trickle of saliva. These are suspect places. I must live in my lantern, trimming subliminal flicker, virginal to the bellows of experience, colored glass. So the reference is here, one, to Cupid, and also to the lantern. Right, reference the myth directly. The idea of virginity as commodity comes into this here as well. Right, but that's a side issue that we'll get to if we have time. Right now, I'm just trying to give you a framework for understanding what's going on in the poem. Right, then we have the pit of bit, the skin sack in which a wanton duality. Um, so on the one hand, the wanton duality is, but okay, the testicles come in pairs, right? Skin sack, wanton duality. But it's also referring to the duality between male and female. If we look 
At fragment four, we see lampshade, red dresses again, references to lanterns, references to lamps. These are not just because Minaloy liked making lampshades and also wearing lampshades. She made wearable lamps. That was part of her thing. <laughs> or, right, right. Lampshade red dresses. Right. But for the abominable shadows, I would have lived among their fearful, their fearful furniture. Right, The shadows that hide Cupid, that hide the lover she can never look at. Where is the bit? Fragment 20 on page 61. Let joy go solace winged to flutter whom she may concern. Now joy, in the myth, is the name of the daughter that Cupid and Psyche conceive together. You also see throughout the poem a lot of references to butterflies. Psyche, in Greek, means both soul and butterfly. Oh, hello. You are not a butterfly. All right, well, this has happened before. I don't know how they get in here. But they usually stay up on the ceiling. So let's just hope it does. As long as we make no sudden moves and don't make it angry, it should probably leave us alone, yes? What is butterfly what? Soul? Yeah, psyche in Greek means both butterfly and soul. Now, we see references to butterflies throughout this. Starting in sag, uh, fragment three, page 54, we might have given birth to a butterfly with the daily news printed in blood on its wings. We see this phrase, we might have, a lot as well. We might have given birth to a butterfly with the daily news printed in blood on its wings. There's a lot of projecting into a possible future that never materialized, right? Now, the butterfly with blood on its wings here, anybody have any idea what this refers to? Pardon? You're close. Abortion. Yes. She's talking here about an abortion. Yeah, there's actually a description in fragment five on page 55 of what happened. Right? Midnight empties the street of all but us three. Right? Him, her, fetus. I am undecided which way back. To the left a boy. One wing has been washed in the rain. The other will never be clean anymore. Pulling doorbells to remind those that are snug. To the right a halo to ascetic threading houses. Probes wounds for souls. The poor can't wash in hot water. And I don't know which turning to take since you got home to yourself first. So who takes her? to get this done. And does he stick around? Leaves her to find her way home by herself, right? So we see here kind of the breaking point in the relationship. She gets the back alley abortion at his prompting. And he is then unsympathetic afterwards, right? He leaves her to deal with it herself. So this is why the poem keeps referencing these kinds of possible futures, so a kind of future that was cut off, something that did not come to fruition. All right, well, that wasp, I think, is making people nervous. And I've at least given you a backbone for understanding the poem here, right? So I'll let you go a little bit early. 
Um, I have some guide questions if I don't trip over the thing and turn them off. And we'll see you all on Monday.